Well, we're reading in Luke chapter 9, beginning this morning in verse 23. It says, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this word. As we come uh, to the end of this series on truly saved, Father, I... I feel the burden as even more than usual to have your Holy Spirit communicate to us effectively and powerfully through your word the importance of this message. Thank you for making it so clear. Well, there's really no one's going to be able to stand before you that's heard these words and say, I didn't get it. You couldn't have made it more clear. You... You do the line in the sand for us, and now the issue is which side are we on? Help us, Father, to understand the grace of God. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Dr. James Kennedy. Not our Dr. James Kennedy. Another <laughs> Dr. James Kennedy, whose pastor was pastor. He's gone to be with the Lord now, but was pastor of the, of the Coral Ridge Church in Florida, for a number of years said this, he said, the vast majority, listen to that, the vast majority of people who are members of churches in America today are not Christians. I say that without the slightest fear of contradiction. I have it on empirical evidence of 24 years of examining thousands of people. I think many of those people that he's talking about have heard this message, just believe, but it's never really been impressed upon them what Jesus says to define those words. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? And that's what this passage of Scripture has been about in verses 18 through 26 or 27 in Luke 9. It's about being truly saved. It's about understanding that it's a costly concern. We've seen how it costs God the Father the life of his own son. We've seen how it costs the son his own life and coming as a man for 33 years here on this earth before he suffered the humiliating death that he suffered and the separation from the Father. And now in these verses, it costs those who would be saved as well. Not unusual. If it's cost the Lord so much, it would cost us. And so he says in verse 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. He didn't say if he would come after me, let him pray this prayer or walk this aisle. It's a lifetime commitment. Made in a moment of time, yes. But it's a lifetime commitment to die to oneself, to one's ambitions, to one's rights, to one's tendency to rewrite the laws of God the way I want them to be. My right to run my own life. But today we want to look at the positive side of this, the reward. The reward is so great. And the Lord wants to make sure that we understand that too. The price is high, but boy, is it ever worth it. Reminds me of these two ladies who work together, right? Nancy and Pam. And Nancy was giving Pam a ride home from work one day, and as Pam got in the car, she saw in the back seat there was this huge, huge box that took up the whole back seat. She said, what, what is that? And Nancy said, well, that's a, that's a brand new 50-inch HD TV. I got it for my husband. And Pam looked at her and said, good trade. <laughs> Good trade. That's Jesus' message here, beloved. What he's letting us know is that it is costly 
to give up allegiance to self, to cast our allegiance at the feet of Christ. It's costly to do that, but it's the best trade you could ever possibly make. You're trading, in one sense, time for eternity when you do that. Now, to, in order to impress upon our minds how great this trade is, Jesus uses three metaphors here to make his point. Each one of them begins with the word for, F-O-R, used in the sense of because, because. So what Jesus is saying here is, here's why it's a great deal to die to self. Because, because, because. He wants us to understand that yes, there's a great cost, but there's a far greater return. So the first because is what? Because it's the only way to gain life. It's the only way. There isn't any other way. And so he says in verse 24, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Now first glance, that sounds a little bit convoluted to us, right? Save your life by losing it. Surely that can't be right. Certainly the world in which we live would not put it quite that way, right? They would tell us it's all about you. You got to take charge of your own life. I mean, you got to find the inner champion, you know. If, if you don't take charge of yourself, who's going to? You have to take charge of your own life. Make it happen. Jesus is saying almost exactly the opposite, isn't he? Instead of saying take charge, he's saying submit. Instead of saying follow your dream, he's saying seek God's dream. He's letting us know that there is something that's beyond and above us, and that's where we have to go. Now, there, there are two things, that, two, two kind of assumptions that underlie the statement that he makes here. The first one is that I can't make it on my own. If I try to save my life, I'm going to lose it. So the message from Jesus is, you can't do this yourself. You'll think you can. It'll feel like you can. You'll think you're doing fine, but you can't. The second assumption, assumption is, if I come to Christ, however, and put my life into his hands, I can't lose. Those are, those are great assumptions to know, right? You don't know those by natural means. They don't come by making observations about life. They only come because we have the revelation of God, but because it's so hard to do, because it's not intuitive. Most people won't go there with Christ. They prefer to trust themselves. They trust themselves more than they trust him. Our natural instinct is to focus intensely on one person, me, right? After all, if I don't, if I don't take care of me, who's going to? I'm the most important person in the world to me. I have an innate, inborn desire to take care of myself, to pursue my ambitions, to pursue my goals, to take care of myself. But look at the verse. It, it, it reads literally, for whoever wishes, whoever wishes, it's a, it's a present tense, meaning this is an ongoing desire. Whoever wishes, desires to save his life. That's a it's, a, it's, a, it's an aorist tense in the Greek. It's a point in time action. So he's saying anybody who wishes ultimately to save their life must first lose it. So what does it mean to save one's life? Well, beloved, it means, it means to protect my existence and give it meaning. To protect my existence and give it meaning. And it, and it really has two elements it's to protect my existence and give it meaning now and to do the same in the life to come. Because of course in the Bible, everything's about the fact that there is an afterlife. It's not just about here and now. But Jesus' point here is that the harder we pursue our ambitions, the further we will be from protecting our existence and giving our life true meaning. As we try to follow our own dictates, as we try to find our own way to do this, we'll be like, uh, it reminds me of the, 
a thing I saw years ago when I was a kid. Anybody remember the Little Rascals, these little short movie things? Little Rascals. And one of them, Stymie, was riding on a little, you know, wagon one day. But he managed he have an ingenious method for mobilizing himself. He had a goat pulling it. And out in front of the goat, he had a stick with a carrot dangling on the end of it, right? So he was holding the stick out there in front of the goat, and the goat was kept lunging for the carrot, couldn't get it, but the wagon kept going the whole time, right? And as soon as he pulled the carrot up, everything stopped, and then he could start it again. It was, I thought it was ingenious. I tried it, it didn't work that great for me, but it was good on the film. Of course, the goat could never quite catch up with what it was pursuing, however. Couldn't get there. In fact, it would eventually kill itself in the process if it went long enough. Somebody, one of the gang hollered out to Stymie as he was on the wagon. He said, Stymie, where are you going? He turned around and said, I don't know, but I'm on my way. <laughs> That's the way it is, beloved, when we're pursuing our own way. We're on a one-way trip to nowhere at the end of the day. That's what Jesus is saying. It looks good. The ambitions you have, the goals you set, the things that drive you, that you think are what are going to make you happy, they look good. They make sense from a human standpoint, but they're not what you were made for. If you don't come to Christ, you can't find who you really are. The Bible is very clear in this. It says in Isaiah 43, Verse seven, everyone who is called by my name that I've created for my glory. See, until we get that settled, we weren't made for, I wasn't made for my glory. You weren't made for your glory. We were all made for God's glory. And until we get to that point, we can't save our life. We, you know, whatever our earthly success, we might as well just, take you know, the, a big L and put it right in the middle of our forehead for, for a loser because that outside of Christ, that's who we are. I've traded eternity for time when I just pursue myself. But now look at the rest of the verse, the second half of the verse. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. In other words, if I, will, if I will give up my rights, if I will give up my ambitions, my agenda, my script, my goals, my control, and deny self and take up my cross daily, if I will do that, I can save my existence. That's the way I become who I was created to be in the first place. That's how I fulfill my destiny, both now and in eternity by pursuing Christ. Counterintuitive, but that's what happens when I defer to him as Lord of life instead of taking it upon myself. And, and, and frankly, at that point, it really doesn't matter in the long run, in the great scheme of things, whether I'm a huge earthly success or whether I die a martyr's death. You see that either way, at the end, what I get is so much greater than what I give up because now I belong to him. Now, we have to make sure we understand there is a cost. He, Jesus acknowledges this. He says, whoever loses his life, it's painful to lose your life. It's painful to voluntarily give up control, isn't it? You don't want to do that. That's not what our inclination is, what the nature that we're born with is. But the payoff is so fantastic. And that's where they tell us maturity is, is, is the ability to look ahead and to, and to forego pleasure now for what we can get later. And that's what the Bible is talking about here. I want you to understand that when we give what we treasure to get what God treasures, in the end of the day, it'll be what we treasure as well. It's the only way to get it. It's the only way to protect ourselves now and in the future. We get by giving, we win by losing. That's not intuitive, is it? And that's why so many people won't go here. The Bible acknowledges, Jesus acknowledges, this is not easy. This is hard. 
We're going to see this again and again. I, you know, I, most of us have been told forever that salvation is just easy. Just come to Christ and it's just easy. Well, it is easy to come. It's not easy to make the commitment and live it out, though. Do you see? Jesus said it this way. He said, the, the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And so those who find it are few. It's the few who are wise who will find it. It's the most unnatural act in the world, in a sense, to give yourself up to the control and to the lordship of Jesus Christ, but it's the only way to get what he offers. And the payoff is so wonderful. It's like a 90-year-old woman I heard of who, you know, she got to that age and, and, and a, a, a niece who was still around was urging her, you need, you need help. So she finally agreed. She hired a companion to come in and the niece thought she'd better check on her. A few weeks later, she went back and said, how's it going? And the older lady said, well, it's, you know, there's, it's, it's good. You know, I, I, don't, I don't have to cook or clean anymore. It's all done for me. I, I don't have to go shopping. Somebody does that. This lady even does my hair. Uh, you know, anything I need helps me get dressed. Everything, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's good. Well, the niece could tell that, you know, there's a little reservation there. She said, well, tell me, how is it really having a companion? She said, companion, I don't have a companion. I'm under new management. <laughs> I'm under new management. Beloved, that's what it is to come to Christ, to deny self, to take up my cross daily, and to follow him. It's to be under new management. But the payoff is so great. We're trading, in a sense, time for eternity when we do this. And in the process, we save our own life. What's the second reason why we might want to die to self? Second one is it's the only way to gain eternal profit. Eternal profit. We're a profit-driven society, aren't we? Look what Jesus says in verse 25, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? You know, in a way, it's the same message in different words, but slightly different emphasis here. Jesus is now acknowledging, hey, listen, I understand the world in which you live. I understand that it's immediate, that it's tangible, that you can look out there if you got $20 in your, in your hand, man, that's, you can see that. You can do something with that. There's some pleasure out there that just grabs you by the neck and you love that thing and it's now and you can have it. And I understand how the world grabs you, but he said, listen, let me, let me suppose for you for a moment that you could have the whole world. Think about that. Think about every wonderful, amazing you know, you know, home that you've seen on the lifestyle of the rich and famous or wherever on television and, 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 and you've looked at it and you thought, wow, that would be great to live there or some place you've visited and now suppose that you have all of them and all the yachts in the world are yours and all the planes in the world are yours and all the silver and the gold and it's all piled in your bank account. It's all yours. Every bit of wealth and pleasure and power and position that the world can offer, it's yours. You're number one. Jesus' point is, if that's all you had, you're a loser. If you had all of that, but that's all you had, you're a loser. Why? Because the moment you die, it would all be gone. You could stack the whole wealth and pleasure and everything else of the world at your doorstep and it equals exactly zero eternal assets. Exactly zero. You've traded eternity for time. And let's face it, most of us aren't going to get the whole world. At best, we're going to get a pretty small portion, right? And yet we're willing to trade it for eternity. Solomon. Solomon inherited a wonderful kingdom from his father David, right? He had great power. He had great wealth. And then God, on top of that, gave him great wisdom so that the Bible tells us he was the wisest man who ever lived. So there he is with 
with unbelievable power. He's got more money than Croesus. He's, he's got world-class intelligence. He's an amazing man. And when the Queen of Sheba comes, and can't believe this, and when she's been with him for a while, she said, wow, they didn't even tell me the half of it. This is an amazing guy who has everything at his disposal. He had 300 wives and 700 concubines. Now, some people might not think that was a great thing. I don't know. It depends on your point of view. But you get the point. The pleasure was there whenever. And anything he wanted was at his disposal. But in the process of getting it all, Solomon lost himself. He forsook God. Those wives and concubines turned his heart away from the God of his fathers to their gods. And he ends up saying in Ecclesiastes 1-2, here's his, kind of his conclusion. He says, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, that's him. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. The payoff wasn't what he expected, wasn't what he thought. You can come down to our day. You think about Howard Hughes. One of the richest men in the world was the richest man in the world at one point in time. Somebody asked him one time, what do you want? And his answer was more. All he wanted was more. All he wanted was more. He wanted more money. So he took the inherited wealth that he got and he turned it into billions of dollars. So he's a wise businessman. He wanted more fame. So he became a broker in Hollywood. He wanted more pleasure and so he paid untold fortunes to indulge his sexual urges with anybody he wanted, man or woman, he could buy them and did. He wanted more thrills, so he designed and built and piloted the fastest airplane in the world. Did you know that Howard Hughes held the world speed record for a while? With an airplane that he designed and had built, he wanted more power, so he dealt political power so effectively that he had congressmen and even probably a couple of U.S. presidents in his back pocket. All he ever wanted was more. But boy, did he lose himself. You've all seen the film, have you? He spent the last 10 years of his life or whatever it was living isolated in that penthouse in Las Vegas, scared to come out of the door. A wretched, paranoid, drug addict, a billionaire junkie. And if he didn't know Christ, beloved, and there's, there's no indication that I know of that he did, if he didn't know Christ, then this very morning as we sit here, he would give everything that he ever had for a bit of cool water to cool his tongue, just like the rich man who woke up in hell in Luke chapter 16. He gained the whole world, but he forfeited himself. How could somebody gain the whole world and end up profitless at the end? Simple, right? Because at the end of 80 or 90 years, no matter how much one stockpiles, it all goes away in the blink of an eye. It's just gone. And, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, eternity stretches out ahead. Eternity, forever, stretches out ahead like a vast wasteland because you've made no provision for eternity because you've not given any thought to that. You've invested nothing in eternity. And eternity is all about the preeminence and the priority and the supremacy of Jesus Christ, and you turned him down. And now he rejects you. You've traded eternity for time, and now payday is here. See, when you put it that way, it sounds kind of foolish, doesn't it? Well, because it is. If the Bible is true, if God is real, if Jesus is who he said he was, you've made a trade that was doomed from the very start. It's not like it was a trade that might work out and might not. It can't, in the end, work out. You've given your life to that which cannot get you anything in return. You're like the rich man in Luke 18. Remember how he piled up everything that he could get. And at, at the end of his, when he, when he came time for retirement, he said, I got to build more barns. I, I don't have room to put all this stuff. It's time to enjoy myself. So he says in Luke 18, verse 19, I will, I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. 
what did God say? You fool. You fool. Why? Because this night your soul is required of you. Nobody guaranteed you any more time. And even if you got it, even if you got another 10 years, what's going to happen at the end of that? Your soul is going to be required. And then who is all this treasure going to be long to? Certainly not to you. So where's your investment? The only way to invest in eternity is by a commitment to Christ and a death to self. The world is so enticing. You know, who would turn down money and power and fame and pleasure, but in the light of eternity, it's, it starts to look pretty small. And I, I, and I realize, you know, at my age, it's a lot easier to look at this and see this. I'm begging those of you, when you're 20s and 30s and 40s, see it this way. Because believe me, it's going to be like that and you'll be where I am and you will see it this way. Suppose a guy goes out and he's, you know, going to buy his wife a brand new diamond ring. So he goes out, he finds the jeweler, he finds this beautiful, beautiful, priceless diamond ring. He buys the ring. The jeweler puts it in this, you know, fuzzy black box and then he wraps it all up. The guy takes it home, gives it to his wife, she unwraps it, she looks at it, she opens it up, says, honey, this is amazing, this is, this is beautiful. I, this is just what I've always wanted, a, a black fuzzy box, this is wonderful. And she takes the ring and she throws it out and she clutches the box. Or he says, that's, that's too foolish for words. And it is. But that's like the person who's living their whole life for what they can gain in the next 40 or 50 years and then it's over. You see, foolish. So Jesus says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits himself? What's the last reason that Jesus gives why we would want to die to self? It's the most important one, really. It's because, beloved, it's the only way we can gain Jesus. It's the only way we can gain Jesus. Look at verse 26, one of the most challenging verses in the Bible. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. <laughs> He's giving you a hint what he looks like here and now as he said this to the disciples isn't what's going to be true forever, right? It's a day coming when he's going to come with his own glory and he's going to come with the glory of the Father and the holy angels in heaven are going to be bowing to him. And he says on that day, what you've done today will have an impact. And if you've denied me today, guess what's going to happen then? I'm going to deny you. Whoa. That's powerful. Is that a challenge? Have you ever been ashamed of Jesus? I have. I've denied him. I've stayed quiet when I should have spoken up. I've let people think it didn't matter. Why? Because I feared what somebody would say. I thought somebody would think me, you know, one of those religious fanatics. I thought somebody would think me dumb. Somebody would think me stupid. Somebody would think me different. Different. We don't want to be different. We don't want to be different. You know, we're like the we're like the teenagers who, who want to rebel, right? So they all rebel by wearing the same exact kind of clothes, right? Talking the same exact language. We don't want to be different. So we deny him. We deny him so others won't deny us. It's so easy to do. God, forgive us. But if that's the pattern of our life, see, you got to ask yourself, is that the pattern? I know, I, listen. I know you're happy to say Jesus. Now, I know you're happy to talk about Jesus when you're here at church. Yeah, you're good, right? But that's not, not what we're talking about. 
We're talking about when you're out there. When you're out there, when you're in the world, who are you then? That's the question. And if there's the pattern there and you deny Christ, if, 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 if the faith we claim, we deny him constantly when we're out there, we, might, we have to take a look. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, he says, he says this, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Here's one of the test questions. Do I, do others, do my friends, people I work with, do they know that I claim Christ? Do they know that I stand for Christ? Do they know that I say that he's the reason for my existence? Do I value the respect of others more than I value the respect of Jesus? That's the question. It's a hard question. But you know, you can't really argue with the logic of it when you think about it. I think I said this a couple weeks ago, but you know, you're ready to get married. You, you get married and you, and, and you go out and somebody says, who's that over there? And you say, I don't know, I never saw her before. Well, how long would you be married? We understand that from a human perspective, right? If you're saying to me, Jesus says, count on it, I'll be ashamed of you. One comedian this touched my funny bone. I don't know if it will yours, but he said, you know, you can always tell when your date is embarrassed and doesn't want to really be with you. He said, it's the little things. It's like you open the car door and she gives you a tip. That would be a clue, right? That she's ashamed to be with you. She doesn't really want to be around you. She wants to leave the impression, ah, I'm not with him. He's just the chauffeur. Are we that way with Jesus? I mean, are we ducking the issue? Who's in charge of our life? R.C. Sproul wrote this when he was commenting on this passage. He says, imagine what it would be like if God appeared with his son standing next to him and surrounded by the court of the heavenly host of angels. How would you feel if they looked at you and you were ashamed to be, and were ashamed to be associated with you? Jesus makes it very clear that if we are ashamed of him before the world, then he will be ashamed of us in the presence of God the Father. I would far rather put up with the scorn of rejection and the shame of the whole world for my whole life than to have Jesus ashamed of me before the Father for five seconds. Got to be looking ahead, beloved. Got to be asking, who do we love most? Is Jesus real to us, or are we just kind of playing at this? I realize we may slip at times, but that can't be, the, can't be the method of our life. It can't be the style of our life. It can't be the habit of our life. Bruce Larson, he's a pastor, commentator on this, and he, he had a, a great illustration. He said, when I was 10 years old, it suddenly dawned on me, I'm 10 years old, and I've got a father who's 70 years old, and he speaks Swedish, barely speaks English, very heavy accent. So he said, I would have friends over. And my friends would, you know, they'd be in the house not very long, and they would say, hey, hey, your grandfather sure has a funny way of talking. He said, I never, never one time did I ever correct them and let them know, no, that's not my grandfather, that's my father. He's ashamed of his father. Of course, later on. He was ashamed of himself. Beloved, that's what Jesus is saying here. If you're ashamed of me now, I'm going to be ashamed of you before the Father. When those who have mocked me, those who have made fun of me, those who never believed at all, when they are separated from my presence, there you will be right with them. Because you've been ashamed of me. You showed your true colors. You see, in those moments of shame. That's who you really were. Didn't matter what you said at church the rest of the time. That's who you really were. Contrast what Larson went through there with his father, with what happened in the record of Stephen. Turn with me. To this is one passage we'll look at today, but to Acts chapter 6. Go past Luke, John, and get to Acts. Acts chapter 6. There's a man named Stephen there who was one of the first deacons in the early church. Actually not called deacons in Acts 6, but they were doing the work of 
diakonos, which is deacon. So these are men who were appointed as the first deacons in the church, and Stephen was one of them, and they picked men who were full of the Holy Spirit, and Stephen was certainly one of them. He was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he was arrested for it. And when they arrested him and they took him in before the authorities, he preached an impassioned sermon. He preached an impassioned sermon that, that didn't pull any punches. He told how, in the, if you just read the Old Testament, you'll see how those, those guys back there, they killed the apostles. They killed the prophets that God sent to them. And now he says to the people he was talking to, and guess what? You killed the most righteous, the most holy, the most anointed one of all. You can imagine the reaction. Acts 7, verse 54 says this, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But look at verse 55. Look at this, beloved. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, and he saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now think about that for just a moment. You remember that back in Exodus 32, Moses asked God to see him, right? Does he want to see the glory of God? And, and, and what did God tell Moses? Listen, I, you know, hide back here and let you see the back end, but you can't see my glory, you'll die. That's how great the glory of God is. But here's Stephen who is about to die a martyr's death and as he looks up, God gives him visibility right into the center of heaven and he sees while he's still on earth, he sees the glory of God. That's amazing. But what's even equally amazing is what happens next. He sees Jesus standing. Now listen, nine times in the New Testament, the Bible tells us about Jesus ascending back to the Father after his work here on earth, right? Nine times. And each time it tells us about that, it tells us that Jesus went and he was seated at the Father's right hand. Seated at the Father's right hand. What's he doing as Stephen sees him? He's standing. He's saluting, paying tribute to this man who has stood for him and as Stephen is about to be executed, he's about to be ushered into glory, there's Jesus saluting him for his courage. What a picture. Stephen lost the respect of the world, beloved, but boy, he gained Jesus, did he not? So you have to ask yourself, what do you want most? Do you want the glory of the world? Do you want the attention of the world? Do you want what the world has to offer? Do you want the respect of the world? Or do you want Jesus? If you choose Jesus is the only way you can win, what Jesus gives back is always worth far more than what we give up. But this is all about salvation. See, understand this passage of Scripture isn't telling how you live after you're saved. Yes, it has implications there. But this is what it means to be truly saved. This is who you must be. This is exactly the reason that Dr. Kennedy could say, I know the churches are full of people who aren't really Christians. They've fooled themselves. They've heard a message that said, just believe, and they've not looked at the translation that Jesus gave to that. You know, our tendency to hang on to the world reminds me of the, you know, the woman who said, I, 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 I didn't want to marry him for his money, but it was the only way I could get it. Remember that story? It's the only way I could get it. That's what a lot of us have done. We've wanted the world so badly that we're married but we gave up Jesus in the process. We're trying to save our own life, trying to call our own shots, trying to be our own controller, trying to be our own master, and Jesus says, no, no, it doesn't work that way. I have to be the one. I think of John Bunyan, the old preacher, arrested in 1660 for preaching the gospel in England. 
could have been released any time by just promising not to preach anymore. And he's in there, he's got children who are sick, his family has no way to make a living while he's there. He was making laces of some kind and trying to give him a little bit of money while he was in jail. His 12-year-old daughter was blind. But John Bunyan wouldn't deny Christ. To no, know some things are worth more than to be released from jail. And so for 12 years, he was there. By the time he got out, his daughter was gone, had died. His family was in bad shape, but in the meantime, God had used John Bunyan to write Pilgrim's Progress, you know, arguably second greatest book in the world next to the Bible, perhaps. Constant stress, constant uncertainty, but they asked him, why would you stay there all that time? Here's what he said. He said, I first passed the sentence of death upon everything, including myself. Secondly, I lived upon God who is invisible and I looked for things which are not seen. May I ask you, what is the salvation that you're depending on? Is it the salvation that looks to things that are not seen and is committed to Christ? And the salvation that says, I want him more than me, I've passed death on myself. Have you traded time for eternity or are you still hanging on to time? That's the question. Jesus says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself or herself and take up his or her cross daily and follow me. That's what it means be truly saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word. Thank you for the clarity. It is a challenge. You knew it was a challenge or you wouldn't have gone on to explain how we benefit by denying self, by giving up some things that look good from a human perspective and from a time perspective. But you've reminded us there's more than that. And so for the sake of that which comes later as well as for the rest of what we live here in time. We must follow you if we are to not lose our life. Don't lose our life, Father. So we want to commit it to you. Help us as we sing this closing hymn to make this the prayer of our heart. And Lord, if I, I just, my prayer is that if there's anyone here today who hasn't really made that commitment to you, but they want to do it today, or at least they want to ask questions about it, Lord, give them courage to come and say, listen, I have some questions I, I need to ask. Can I ask you, or do you have something you could give me to, uh, to read maybe? Lord, we have resources we could provide. I want them to know you. Lord, help us to examine our own hearts. We really we really given up time for eternity or are we still hanging on pretty hard to time? Help us to decide for you, for our sake, but most of all for yours. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.